Okay, we're back from the break again, and we're going to be, uh, well, first a couple things to do. Uh, in the next class, hand in the copies of the in-class assignments for both chapters 1 and 2. And just as a little refresher, some of the chapter goals here to have a, a good understanding of the NMOS transistor and be able to extrapolate that to PMOS and uh, this more terminology is sort of the regions of operation. Uh, this is a, a bit of an appendix here that uh, sort of demonstrates how an uh, NMOS transistor works. It's perhaps not physics, but it's perhaps more sociology. Anyway, in this uh, analog here, we have positive charges, which are girls and they're mobile. We have negative charges and they're boys and they're mobile. And you also have some uh, negative old man charges and they're not mobile. So the situation initially starts off like this, where there's some mobile girls and, and old men in the bulk. And uh, there's a glass window here and there's a, some supply of girls here and there's a source and a drain, just like an MOS transistor. Uh, some girls uh, come to the window. They basically repel the girls that are inside the the uh, channel, and uh, lines of force from those girls end up on the old men. So those are still not mobile charge in the channel. Uh, a few more girls are supplied to the to the uh, gate, and uh, they attract some mobile charges into the channel area. And these would come from the source and drain regions. Uh, a few more girls, of course. There's going to be then accumulation of boys in the channel. Uh, now what you need is have to have some motivation for the boys to leave the drain and in this case it's a, a pint of beer. And at that point in time the mobile charge of the, the boys move across the channel and they end up uh, being picked up at the drain. So uh, if you don't understand physics, I'm sure you understand that basic, uh, the basic behavior of people. Anyway, here's some reality for a 22 nanometer process. Uh, this is slightly different than all the ones we looked at before because this is the uh, the FinFET type of uh, MOS transistor and it's a really a total facelift for the MOSFET device. Uh, it operates very similarly but uh, it's certainly laid out and manufactured in quite a different style. Okay, before we were looking at planar devices, now we're looking at something that resembles this thing and uh, it still has a drain in the source and then the, the gate and in between this little region here would be where the, the channel is. And this is how it would look if it's uh, basically laid out from a photomicrograph at the lowest levels where they basically indicate where the, the metal gate would be, the, the source and the, the drain, and the, let's say the width of the fin is illustrated there, and the pitch that would be the, the distance between the, the fins, etc. So the gate length is still as we'd expect. Um, the fin height now is going to be related to our a width of our transistor. So here's a particular example where they sort of show the gate height being, uh, what was it here, uh, 35 nanometers and as a consequence the the total uh, gate width is about 80 nanometers. So it's it's uh, 35 nanometers on the side and then a little bit across the top. That would correspond to the W of our planar device. So we're basically we ask yourself how well would our equations hold up? Well, uh, our equations weren't very good in the first place, so they they're probably still not very good. Uh, this is the uh, a schematic of uh, what you could get out of these fin fets. Two different types shown here. Uh, one is a little bit more flexible than the other. It's called independent gate, and the other is the shorted gate, which is probably the little more common. In this particular case, the the gate you know completely surrounds the fin over here. The there's basically two gates associated with the fin. And again, there's the height of the device, and this would be the the length. Uh, this is how logic design, you know, could proceed, and uh, certainly does in some cases. Uh, in A, even though we haven't looked at the NAND gate, you have in other courses. It's a slightly more complicated uh, looking set of connections because we have basically an illustration where we have the gate which is contacted on both sides of the fin but this is just a direct transistor for transistor replacement with the fin fets replacing your planar transistors so that's a direct substitution over here you see you have some flexibility on one side of the uh, this would be an independent gate mode again but on one side of the gate it can be tied to a different potential so in the case of the n-type devices uh, basically tied lower the case of the p-type devices basically tied to a higher voltage and as a consequence, it becomes a low power mo mode. We have an increased uh, VT and uh, reduced uh, subthreshold leakage. Uh, here's another one with an independent gate shown where you have fewer transistors, sort of A and B share uh, uh, some fins up here. And down here, they're just connected up as they would have been in the, in the uh, direct substitution mode. But one less transistor, effectively, here. 
at what looks to be like one less transistor. And over here you get a mode where you can then control the the threshold voltage again, so it's slightly slower, and, and uh, the advantage being that it would have uh, less leakage current. I suspect this is the one that's most commonly used for logic repl uh, replacement, direct substitution. Uh, sizing, we'll discuss that a little bit. This is sort of a schematic again of what it might look like. Here's the gate, here's a source and a drain, and here's a whole bunch of fins sitting in here. In this particular case, it's four fins. So. Since you can't change the height, that's a process constraint that you're, you're, as a designer, you certainly have no control over. So you'd use multiple fins. If you want more drive, if you had one fin, you'd have a certain amount of drive. If you have two fins, you have twice that drive. Three fins, three times that drive. Four fins, four times that drive type of thing. Uh, and if you want to find some more information on this, this is where I found this. I just Googled FinFET circuit design. So here's a in-class assignment. Why would these two gates here, this inverter one and this NAND gate two, uh, have approximately equal rise and fall times? So we haven't discussed these in any great detail, but it's your old inverter friend. It looks a little bit different here because in the FinFET mode, uh, but we will look at it in a bit more detail. So this is the N-type transistor, P-type transistor, and the thing to note is that uh, in the pull-up part, you had four fins, and in the pull-down section down here, you have two fins. So I'll just look at the inverter. Uh, the only thing to, to make note of, as we saw from the, the current equations before, that the drive was proportional to W over L. So that was for our planar device. So this looks like this thing up here. It clearly looks like there's four fins, and they're each of height eight, H rather. So the width would be associated with those fins of approximately two H. There's a, you know, the fin on the way up and the fin on the way down. So in total, it would look like a, a width of eight H, because there's four fins present. In the pull-down section, two fins of height h, so the width is 2h, and there's two of them, so in total it looks like 4h. So basically these things are out by a factor of 2, and that's compensated for by virtue of the fact that the mobility of the electrons is roughly twice that of the holes. So you'd have roughly equal uh, uh, drive, hence equal rise and fall. For the AND gate kind of configuration, we'll just look at the worst case. The worst case is going to be where where one of these is going to uh, do the pull-up, and uh, in the case of pull-down, both of these transistors have to be on. So in this case, it looks like two fins of height H. So as we saw before, that looks like a W of 2H each. So in total, it looks like a 4H width for that device. So the drive would be 4H or whatever that over whatever that L min was. In the pull-down section, this looks like two fins of height H. So that implies a W of 2H each. So W is 4H, and it's in series with two fins of height H, so, and they also have a W of 4H. But the point here is that L, you can now think of it as being 2L min, so basically the drive looks like 4H over 2L min. So, you know, just do a little arithmetic, it's 2H over L min. Again, we see that this is out by a factor of 2, compensated for the fact, by the fact, rather, that the mobility of the holes is twice half that of the mobility of the electrons. So you'd have roughly equal fall and rise time for the worst case scenario. Now this is this uh, uh, TEM, so that's a transmission electron microscope image or photomicrograph. This would be the fin itself. I guess this is the silicon inside the channel region. This here is the gate dielectric, and this would be the gate outside here somewhere, or maybe even it down in here. Not 100% certain, but that's the idea behind it. And as you can see, it sort of looks kind of finger shaped. Uh, this is the photomicrograph of uh, somebody reverse engineered, and you can see that there's uh, six transistors sitting here for a six transistor SRAM, and they identify the number of fins associated with those different devices. Obviously, this wouldn't be something that would be easy to do, and this company up here actually makes its money by reverse engineering these and, and providing parameters and specifications for what they think is being manufactured. So here's a chapter summary for chapter two. You should have a good understanding of the planar CMOS device, um, and uh, that in particular is the, the NMOS transistor, and that's at a minimum. Uh, you also expect you to be able to drive anything related to the PMOS device just by knowing the NMOS device. Uh, some appreciation for the guiding equations. Those were all basically back of the envelope type equations where we looked at you know, how much charge would be in the channel and then how long it took the charge to get across the channel. Uh, some appreciation for technology issues. As we saw, these de these devices all leak. They have a, a current even when we think the device is off, so we have to account for that because it'll contribute to power dissipation. And some of the strategies you can use to uh, improve the performance of a device uh, with respect to, let's say, power might be the threshold voltage control. And lastly, we looked at sort of a radical evolution to 
to uh, the technology node when it's less than 10, 10, 22 nanometers. And uh, for example, there we're looking at the FinFET in a little bit of detail. And, and some of the design ramifications of going to the FinFET mode as opposed to the planar transistor mode. Uh, basically, you can think of that as like an evolutionary kind of process, and the FinFET being quite a, a, a radical departure, which which means there's going to be lots of change, but um, hopefully, you know, significant improvements and another leap forward in, in CMOS technology. So that's the end of chapter two.